recent finding is really exciting to us because at the moment there is no biological marker for autism. So uh, a child is diagnosed by uh, having autism uh, by uh, behavioral analysis, usually by a psychiatrist or a psychologist. And um, the reality is that uh, that really is not very accurate until the child is about 18 to 24 months or even older. We uh, did a study here at UC Davis Mind Institute with, uh, really was a team approach uh, with Sally Ozanoff, who's an expert in uh, uh, evaluating uh, the siblings of children who have autism uh, because they're much more likely to have autism themselves. And uh, we uh, collaborated with her in order to do magnetic resonance imaging of the brains of these children uh, when they were very young. So we started imaging the children when they were only six months of age, and then they would come back every six months after that for two other times. And ultimately, uh, Sally and her team would uh, diagnose the child, usually in the 18 to 24 month range. And then we would determine whether there was anything in the MRI images uh, that was diagnostic of the child having autism. And again, at six months of age, when this study starts, there is nothing in the behavior of the child that will distinguish a child that goes on to have autism from a child that goes on to typical development. And what we found, which was actually sort of surprising to us, was that the children who go on to have a diagnosis of autism had an excess of cerebral spinal fluid between their brains and their skull. Now, cerebral spinal fluid is in everybody's brain. It's sort of a shock absorber. It allows the brain to not damage itself if, if the skull is hit. Uh, there are some diseases where there's too much cerebral spinal fluid, and we usually call that hydrocephalus. Now, the children that we studied don't have the classical form of hydrocephalus, but what we noticed, and this was actually first uh, uh, brought to our attention by uh, the radiologist, Dr. Sandra Gorgias, who looked at all of these scans to make sure there wasn't something overtly wrong with the child's brain. She kept reporting, and she didn't know which children were going to go on to have autism or which children were going, to, going on to have typical development. She uh, kept reporting that several of these children had what she called benign extraaxial fluid. Um, and what, again, that means is that there was too much of this cerebral spinal fluid on the outside of the brain, in between the brain and the skull. Well, when uh, the MRI team, and that's mainly Mark Shen, who's a graduate student, and Christine Nordahl, who's an assistant professor here at the Mind Institute, and I saw these images, we thought, wow, it, it, it seems to be coming up more often in the children that, uh, at least initially, there were concerns that they might have autism. So what we've done in this study is actually quantified uh, by making very uh, detailed measurements of the amount of this cerebral spinal fluid. And uh, sure enough, it is more common in the kids who go on to have autism than the kids who go on to have typical development. So in this study, which uh, had around 65 kids initially, we had 10 children who had uh, ultimately had an autism diagnosis. Those 10 children, uh, when you looked at them together, had highly significantly increased amounts of the cerebral spinal fluid. Moreover, if you just measured the amount of cerebral spinal fluid at six months of age, it was predictive of how serious their autism was going to be when they were diagnosed at 24 months. So uh, eight of the 10 children actually had this increase of the cerebral spinal fluid. So uh, we're very excited about this because, uh, first of all, uh, this is the first study that we know of where uh, we've done imaging with the magnetic resonance imaging system at six months of age and then followed the children until they ultimately were diagnosed with autism. Uh, and this marker, uh, the increased cerebral spinal fluid, is something that's relatively easy to identify. One of the advantages of having an early biological marker of autism is that we know that children who go into early intensive th treatment, behavioral treatment, do better. They, their disability is decreased, their intelligence goes up, and the likelihood that they'll have a 
um, a, a life that will have much higher quality than other children goes up as well. But how do you make a decision that the child should go into intensive early behavior therapy? We think that this marker, if it's proven to be reliable, and again, it does need to be replicated, uh, would be something that a standard neurologist or radiologist could actually detect very early on. Uh, in my mind, what that would mean is that these are the children that should that will deserve extra attention and that you'd want to bring to a psychologist at 12 months of age, for example, for a follow-up analysis. You wouldn't want to wait till 18 to 24 months. Now, um, in the past, uh, children who have a rapidly expanding uh, skull, uh, that's been a red flag that something might be wrong. And in fact, there are maybe two or three papers in the entire literature that have studied children that have the rapidly expanding brain with the MRI and have noted this benign extraaxial fluid. But you know, I've said over and over again, benign, because in the field, people thought that generally it resolves, that it, that it goes away over the first couple of years of life. What we found in our study was that when we looked at the children who went on to have autism, that not only did they have extra fluid at uh, six to nine months, but it persisted at 12 to 15 months and then at 18 to 24 months. So it may be that while you, you would see this anomaly in many children, some of whom are not going to go on to have autism, that the persistence of it over time is going to be the real red flag. So it is something that um, neurologists and, and pediatric radiologists could pick up on. I think uh, our paper hopefully will alert them that you know what they had previously considered to be benign may not necessarily be so benign and should be paid more attention to. Cerebral spinal fluid is just not water. It's actually a system for carrying out toxic waste from the brain. It also is a system for carrying out what's called trophic factors that regulate how the brain develops. So you can imagine it like a uh, like a uh, sewer system, in a sense, of just constantly taking out things that are bad from the brain and bringing it back to the body into, into a waste mechanism. Well, if, if that process is slowed down, you end up with cerebral spinal fluid that has a higher concentration of these toxic wastes sitting above places like the frontal cere cerebral cortex. Well, there are a couple of laboratories in the country that are saying, you know, could that affect brain development? And it turns out the answer is yes. So some of those trophic substances that are in the cerebral spinal fluid actually regulate things like how many neurons get generated or whether they migrate and where they migrate away from their, their birth place to where they're going to end up in the brain. So it could be that having this extra cerebral spinal fluid above the places like the cerebral cortex that we know are important in autism may have a direct causal effect on, at least for some children, uh, on the development of their autism.